Welcome to the People, Planet, Profit podcast. I'm Hayley Jarrick, CEO of the Supply Chain Sustainability School. This podcast was recorded as part of an event and video series developed by one of the school's working groups. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Village Voices, an event series with experts in local government sustainability brought to you by the Supply Chain Sustainability School's local government working group. Today, we're joined by Julian Donlan, who's the Principal Sustainability Partnerships Officer in the City Planning and Sustainability team at the City of Port Phillip. Welcome, Julian. Thank you, Hayley. Good to be here. So we're going to jump straight into some questions. But before we do, um, I think it's probably really good to sort of set the scene for people who haven't heard of where um, where Port Phillip is um, geographically, um, give us a bit of a background about its first peoples, the type of demography of people who live there, um, sort of, you know, enable us to, to close our eyes and imagine um, where it is that you spend your days. Right. Well, the city of Port Phillip is fortunately located uh, in the suburbs, in the southern suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, it has 11 kilometres of foreshore on beautiful Port Phillip Bay and visitors to Melbourne, both uh, local and international, would probably know St Kilda as the most famous place out of Port Phillip. It was an amalgamation of three cities in Victoria, St Kilda, Port Melbourne and South Melbourne. Uh, though it's one of the smallest cities in Melbourne metro area, it's one of the most diverse. Um, our council magazine is called Diversity for a reason. So we describe Port Phillip as really a series of villages. Uh, in Though they're in close proximity, a lot of places have very distinct character. Um, and that's flavored by the demographic as well. We have... Um, a lot of different multicultural communities, a very transitional community, so a lot of renters living in a city and, and uh, we know are moving out. Um, a lot of people who are very connected to where they live and in sustainability, we're also trying to connect them to the natural local environment as much as possible, which is largely Port Phillip Bay. Awesome. And so to give me a bit of a, and, and to feel, and also we, um, just to acknowledge country as, as before we move on. So who, who are the first peoples in city of Port Phillip? So we have a couple now. Uh, so we have the, the Bunurong as traditional custodians. Um, we formerly had the Boomerang, who were local, and the Yalika Willem clan of the Boomerang, who were very local to St Kilda and Port Phillip area. Um, and now we also have Wurrung Wurundjeri in the top half, the uh, Yabba River um, end of Port Phillip uh, around South Melbourne and towards the CBD. So, yeah, it's it's evolving, but um, settled as far as our Aboriginal custodians are uh, concerned now. Well, it's nice to know that even, like, you know, for the last... 50,000 years, it's always been um, multiple clans coming together um, and still with the multi with the diversity that's still there today, it's still a lot of different people all coming together um, and, and building up that diverse community. Um, and so if I was trying to say, so I'm thinking, um, so if, I, if anyone who's come to Melbourne, it is that South Melbourne part that's hugging the bay. Um, I'd imagine um, a lot of, you know, pop, the, the age of people, probably the middle age, sort of 35, 40 ish, um, a lot of singles and couples renting in spaces so they can do easily commutes into the city for work. Am I sort of. Yeah, all of that and probably um, even wider on the spectrum. I, I should say, yeah, so St Kilda is probably historically known as Melbourne's playground at C90, St Kilda Pier, way back when. Um, and that's that's probably true in a um, traditional owner sense as well. We have a, a, a place called the Nani Tree where groups from around um, well, what's now the Melbourne region would come together and celebrate, uh, Nani being a, a, a local indigenous word for gathering place. Uh, so, yeah, it's still that. <laughs> for lots of different communities um, come and call it home and stay. Um, yeah, the uh, including multicultural communities. So Port Melbourne is a place where in the 50s and 60s, uh, migrants would arrive by boat, um, would often um, land a local job in the factories of the nearest place they, they got off in Melbourne and set up family homes here. Those, those that generation, so which are still here, very elderly, but a lot of Greek and Russian species, particularly um, from that era. 
but yeah, renters, um, professionals living in the city, living a short commute away, um, families, uh, yeah, lots of over 50% in uh, apartments and over 50% in renters. Excellent. And so when we're talking about lots of people, like what sort of density are we thinking? Is it like a thousand people, a hundred thousand people, a million people? Like what's sort of the population of the <laughs> is it 11 Ks that you said from top to bottom? Yeah, so uh, so about 108,000 people, which is roughly the size of most municipalities in, in Melbourne. Uh, and I think it's the most densely populated we describe it as, but similar to other inner city areas in Melbourne. Excellent. Well, I hope that, that everyone who's sort of watching this back or listening on the, on the podcast or sort of has their eyes closed and they're sort of imagining this, um, you know, maybe for those that can see your background, sort of the, the PR and the water and this tranquil, beautiful place that has, you know, water views and is close to the city. Um, and like you said, it is sort of the playground area. Um, for me, I'm like a Sydney Swans fan so I'm like all in South Melbourne <laughs> heritage wise <laughs> um, but you know the sort of that sort of the, the flavor of everyone's coming through then so then let's talk about um, well, what are you doing from a sustainability strategy point of view and and how are you measuring how you're achieving that like what sort of KPIs are you getting in there and um, and then give us a bit of a context for then how you're trying to deliver that from like a staffing um, numbers point of view um, within the council? Uh, so, yeah, so, Hallie, we're at a really transitional point um, because we've um, got a fairly new team in sustainability. Um, I've only come back here uh, about three months myself, having worked here 10 years previously. Uh, and it's really a rebuilding phase, both in terms of what we're trying to achieve and the actual team to deliver it. Uh, we um, are building up to a team of around 12 officers across the spectrum of sustainability from uh, everything from climate adaptation, integrated water management, uh, water sensitive design, um, through to partnerships with community um, energy and greenhouse specialists, and probably the humans fit somewhere in there as well. Uh, into internal influence around all the projects that involve anything sustainability. So there's a very um, collaborative focus with the rest of the organisation who uh, deliver capital projects, um, who uh, procure our fleet. So lots of, as you're probably aware, any local government, there's lots of people you need to uh, influence and connect with to get sustainability outcomes. So um, rebuilding a team, um, we probably have six currently and, and building up to 12, if anyone's interested, in look out on our website for positions, um, to, to be able to provide, um, deliver those outcomes which are growing. Uh, the reason for that is um, you know, COVID uh, went through a bit of a, a decline in and reset, I guess, of the positions required. Uh, and the other, the other main reason why we're sort of starting again, it's a bit, a bit of an exciting point, is that our Act and Adapt uh, sustainability strategy was 10 years, started in 2018. So it's now a bit over four years since it's been adopted. Um, and it was always meant to be at the halfway point around 22, 23, to have a look at what's been achieved, what still needs to be done, what new things need to be added. So we're at the very start of uh, answering those questions and um, for going through the process of revising a strategy with that means without losing the intent and the principles behind it, but um, certainly updating the actions. Excellent. Well, I, I, if this hasn't been a great advertisement for anybody looking to come and work and join your team, I don't know what is. Come join Melbourne's Playground <laughs> and work with an exciting new developing team um, who is just re revising its strategy, which sounds really, really fun and exciting. So I, I hope you get a swarm of applicants and a great team. Um, in terms of then, so let's sort of delve into a, a bit more of a detail in that. So what are the sort of topic areas that are um, sort of the top of your agenda? I know there's always, in sustainability, there's always a plethora and they always interrelate with each other. Um, but if you had to sort of, you know, pick out a handful, um, mm. 
of just where the the, the topics, uh, sustainability topics that are front of mind when you're when you're looking to review your strategy, um, and in all of the um, the tasks and actions and um, programs that you're developing and running. Sure. Uh, well, yes, Port Phillips had a, got a long history of being involved in sustainability before that was a common term. Um, so it's always had a real uh, community focus on um, doing what we need to do as an organisation to be sustainable and lead uh, what should happen in the community, but also an enabling community as well. Um, the, one of the key things um, geographically about Port Phillip is very low-lying area prone to uh, flooding and inundation. And as mapping has got better around the long-term climate change impacts of that, we know there are certain areas that would be under threat much more frequently from um, both uh, uh, major floods, um, but also it's combined with sea level rise being a baseline municipality. Um, so that's been a primary focus of how we plan um, new areas of development. Uh, being close to the city, there's large precincts earmarked to have much more development, tall apartment buildings, but that sit on uh, would be threatened land. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the focus is on identifying where those long-term threats are and um, involving the strategic planners particularly in how do we um, accommodate that growth uh, of the city but address the, the threats of climate change impacts. So that certainly is a lot of the work has gone in the last few years to identify that. So of the themes, um, I'd say water would be the most prominent to date. Um, because energy and greenhouse emissions are always and have always been focused around reducing environmental impact. So um, our organisation is effectively carbon neutral, though we're not certi certified against the Climate Active Standards, um, mainly for budgetary reasons, I think. But it's, uh, uh, it's, it's always been um, uh, trying to reduce emissions and be most, most efficient about how we use uh, energy, so we're on a, a long-term uh, power purchase arrangement with other councils to have renewable electricity supplied and continually looking to, um, I guess now it's the future actions going forward, how do we get all our council buildings off gas? Um, and what we would expect in a new strategy with community input is how do we reduce our community emissions? Um, council, council's footprint for life is only about 1% of the emissions of the whole municipality. So a lot of our, while we've had a long history of engagement in the community, um, how do we help them reduce that other 99% of greenhouse emissions and keep them down um, with targets uh, in mind? That's probably our main, main focus going forward. Uh, we've always had a, a, a good internal focus on um, uh, transport emissions. So we currently have 18 electric vehicles in our fleet, which I was surprised to learn when I arrived here. Uh, a lot of the fleet has been transitioned to electric, which is great. Um, but we don't have uh, our first public EV charger out in the community yet, which is being a, a, an area for tourists to come to, to, to not only Melbourne, but come and explore the foreshore. Um, yeah, we're, we're a little bit behind other councils in that area. So um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure of any council who's done everything perfectly as yet, but um, yeah, we, we have some areas of focus where we've done some great things, but need to do more going forward. Thanks for that. I think that's a, that's a really great summary. And I think that, um... If I was to say anything, I'm like, be a little kind to yourself. I think that um, generally as, as most, uh, most actually most people in sustainability across the board, no matter which industry that you work in, I think we always sit there and always think about the next thing um, or the, the projects that we haven't quite finished or the ones that haven't got off the ground. Um, and I think that that's kind of an area where we sort of beat ourselves up more than other people might do looking at us and sort of coming in and, and playing around in that space as well. So um, don't be too hard on yourself <laughs> um, is one area. True. But then following along that, 
and yeah. following all that vein because like you said there's always going to be something else right there's always going to be something new something there's always a list that's longer than you can possibly ever achieve and you're only ever tackling um the priority areas that you end up um and getting in there and as soon as you finish those projects there's always others on the list um and then there's forever new things coming onto that list as well um so like you said it'd be great you know I'm, I'm sure that you, you can get your ev charging stations in there but wouldn't it be great if nobody needed a car to come down <laughs> you know Absolutely. um you know all, you know all riding riding around on uh e-scoot as well is another challenge but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's uh, you. We, we do push ourselves a little harder, and you will always have a very green community here, and I'm sure in other places who want councils and governments generally to go um, faster and harder and sooner and set ever decreasing targets. But um, reality is, it takes time and money to deliver things. And yeah, you do have to appreciate the good outcomes that um, are achieved along the way. Um, then, if, yeah, well, I, I think there's a lot of momentum just talking to other uh, colleagues and local governments here. I um, feel like we're starting to get there. There's always, um, you can never tell people, um, I told you this was coming. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, we do need to um, uh, celebrate successes and recognise achievements. Um, mindful that there's still a fair way to go. Well, I think that you're doing um, pretty well with half a dozen people, but you want double that. <laughs> and of course, that that's sort of, like you said, that limits a lot of what you can do. But on that vein, I mean, let's finish on some high notes here. You know, what are you doing well at the moment? Like, what are the strengths that your council's doing really well um, that others can learn from? I think, um, yeah, well, obviously we've only got um, six people. Um, what I've noticed in um, coming back here after five years in another council is a much more collaborative approach to sustainability. So um, it doesn't have to be explained to people or there's, there's, there's certainly far less blockers. It's more, okay, we have to do this to that. The best outcome obviously includes sustainability. So not having to, um, I remember days when we had to explain the definition of sustainability and, and what it meant and people were a bit nervous, well, that's not my perhaps that's what you do. Um, now that doesn't seem to occur as much. Um, so yeah, very much an organisational focus on doing things together, getting the right people in the room at the start. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one thing I think that works where um, there's no, uh, should we invite the sustainability people along to this capital project we're doing? It's automatically part of what we're doing. Um, so that's a real change, I think, that in the last few years, that's um, really positive to see. And um, yeah, I mentioned the, the fleet transition was one, was another really good one. Um, we have we are in a, an alliance, we're looking to how do we do the joint procurement across councils for things like leasing fleet vehicles? So to find out that we had so many here and one council has done it. I said, well, that's that's great. We need to share that with other councils. So they know what we're doing. And there is um, there is a lot more sharing going on both within and across uh, councils and other organisations at the moment, which is just great and solve problems together. I think they're two amazing things to celebrate. Um, and not only because it's so, um, uh, it can be copied so easily, right? Like. Every council can do that. You know, I think that um, similarly to you, I remember the days when, you know, the S word was never spoken um, and that you're constantly begging to get involved in things or that everyone sat around and went, oh, finally we found that out at the start. You know, we could have integrated that in. Um, or if I knew about that when we started planning this project, it would have been far simpler from the get go. So I'm really encouraged that um that your council has managed to, to cotton on to that um, and are really implementing that. And I hope that that gives um, hope to other councils who aren't quite at that, like, that part of the journey that, you know, it's always good to have someone else doing it that you can say, well, Port Phillip, Phillip does it this way. Um, and hopefully that'll um, bring some other councils on board with following that same vein that aren't quite there yet. Um, and like you said, I really, really like the the collaboration element of everything that happens and I think that uh, the local government sphere is particularly poised well to be able to do that because you've got so many businesses that operate within your LGAs that you can tap into so many small businesses that are sort of 
literally within arm's reach um, to be able to collaborate with. And then there's this sense of community that sort of happens at that local level that you can go and, and pair up with other um, councils in your region and get collective agreements. I think the other thing I'll congratulate you for um, is I'm, um, I love it when um, governments lead the way in adopting new fleets and things as well, because I think um, that that's, that's one thing we talk about, you know, electrifying the vehicles across Australia. Um, and one of the biggest ways to do that is to increase electric vehicles in the second hand market. And the biggest way to do that yeah. is all the lease vehicles that when they come up to the end of their lease and the new Ooh. ones come in for the new leases, then those vehicles enter the second hand market. And I think that that is one of the best ways to sort of then uh, boost the stockpile up of electric vehicles is when government entities and people who have big lease hire arrangements for vehicles start to electrify their fleets because then we can see those flow on effects and it makes you know buying a secondhand electric vehicle an affordable option for people um, to be able to get in there and and have more environmentally friendly outcomes so I think they're, mm. they're just amazing things and two great wins um, and it must feel great to have worked somewhere then gone away and come back and really had that chance to reflect um, on the changes that have occurred that have um, that have occurred over that time um, and also just being you know really proud that some of the seeds that you plant years ago might take a little while to grow but it is nice to see them um, come up as saplings um, later on as well. Yeah, so with all of that, especially when you haven't done anything towards them, so that's that's even nicer <laughs> that other other people have uh, to adopted that challenge and they're working within the organisation. So yeah, finding more allies is definitely um, a great benefit. We um, you've you've got yeah, as I said, more more people to draw from, not just a, a team of six or twelve. Yeah. Love it. Love it so much. And I and I really like the idea of saying, yes, well, the sustainability team is 12, but technically the however many hundred people work at council are all part of the sustainability team in one way, shape or form. Yeah, um, and yeah. Well, it's pretty much everyone's well. responsibility. I think that's how we used to frame it, that they needed to do yeah. it as part of their role just by working for a, a, a sustainably minded organisation with what is that's council or wherever. So, uh, yeah, making those things just part of what you do to be a person working here um, was was crucial to getting um, that mindset in place for some people and then you've always got the, the passionate people who would do it as part of their jobs whatever because um, they realize it's the right thing to do i love it i love it oh well if anyone's looking to sort of move around melbourne um i'm sure that after hearing this you'll probably jump online and google you know uh rental vacancies in port philip <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing um, with everybody listening, just sort of where you're at um, and all the great things that you are doing, because I think that that sort of step one is sort of sharing everything that you're doing and gaining that sort of that, uh, you know, just getting it out there and then having people come back and collaborate with you as well is a great place to start. So thank you, um, Julian, for joining me today. No problem. You're very welcome, Ali. Great to be with you. And thanks everyone for listening. Um, until our next episode, bye for now.